good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third panel of Urban Arc 2021 on navigating the city. Uh, I'm Pooja Rao, a senior associate at IHS. Uh, I'm a transportation planner by training, and I work on mobility, uh, generally looking at uh, mobility and equity, using open data, uh, data and methods for understanding mobility and financing of transportation. Uh, welcome to the panel. Uh, as, uh, let me introduce you to the panel. We have four papers as part of the panel today. And uh, we'll be looking at four different cities uh, from all across India. We have Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, and Bangalore. Uh, and uh, I'll first we'll uh, hear from Neha Gupta from uh, National Institute of Technology, Silchar, who is presenting on algorithmic mobility is the Uber view of Calcutta. Uh, second, we have Prajwal Nagesh from Utrecht University presenting on understanding aging and mobility in Bengaluru. Uh, third, we have Shiti Shobha Vikas from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, presenting an exploratory research on the use of public transport by fisherwomen in Mumbai. Uh, finally, we have Sakshi Joshi from Manipal Academy of Higher Education presenting on the uh, free bus rides for women scheme in Delhi. Uh, now, I'm very excited for these presentations. They all explore a common theme of how mobility is often exclusionary, uh, but by looking at it from different perspectives. Uh, uh, so let's uh, begin. So each of the presentations will go for uh, 15 minutes. We'll have 20 minutes at the end of the panel for uh, question and answers and discussion. So I request uh, all the people who are attending the panel to type in their questions or, or discussion points in the chat so that uh, I can take them up later. Uh, thank you. So uh, over to you, Neha, for the first presentation. Hi. Okay. So uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. I'll just share my screen and uh, so that you can look at the presentation. Um, yeah. So, yeah, is the screen visible? Yeah, hi. So, hi, everyone, and a very good afternoon to everyone listening. Uh, before I start, let's just consider why is this worth probing or why is this an important site of investigation? So, in 2019, in response to the plummeting figures of the auto industry, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman suggested that the Melanian mindset that prefers taxi aggregators uh, like Ola and Uber is responsible for the dismal performance of the auto industry. Now, this reasoning, it kind of highlights the centrality of of the automobile to public discourses and an auto-centric approach to development that foregrounds a set of ideas that uh, uh, about mobility and navigation that have come to dominate the public sphere, even though they exclude the mobility needs of uh, many. Now, in its uh, persistence, In its persistence, this tech, uh, Uber's tech-inflected uh, tech automobility has become a regime of mobility that exercises explicit ideological, governmental, and political control to po powerfully shape the society. Now, uh, as we all know, as Uber has grown, it has expanded it, its offerings not only to other forms of transportation like auto rickshaw and even uh, uh, helicopters, uh, Uber has uh, uh, grown, uh, I mean, uh, it, they are also offering freight and delivery services, subprime auto financing and provision of real time data to municipal planners. So uh, Uber treats, Uber treats cities as clients and helps them reimagine the public space. And my inquiry then is how Uber functions as an actor within this differential speciality. I argue that data density, uh, uh, in this scenario, data density modulates legibility. And using a multimodal approach that looks at Uber maps, the algorithm in uh, existing literature, and, a historic uh, and the historic imagination of the city, I very cautiously hint at a correlation between concentrated data environments and visibility. 
So uh, it is important to ask whether Uber reconfigures or replicates existing relations of ex exclusion and marginalization that operate within the transportation network of the city. And uh, I, now I'll look at a little bit of the historic imaginations uh, of the city and I'll describe what the colonial town looked like. So this is uh, a map of Calcutta from 1790 to 93. And uh, it is, uh, the shape of a city is never coincidental. And Calcutta is often described using the metaphors of maze and labyrinth. And there's a re reason for how this came to be. The military considerations of uh, uh, the colonial government started, construct started the construction of this Fort William, second Fort William, along which the city has expanded uh, uh, to uh, in the uh, in the in the village of Govindapur, and this kind of engendered mass mobility, whereby people from this location were moved to the adjoining village of Chaurangi, which is now a very uh, which is now the central part of Calcutta, and uh, 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 and the rich people from the Govindapur area they kind of shifted to. Chitpur, in uh, 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 this kind of shifted north along the Chitpur road, which uh, allowed for the expansion of the Chitpur road, and uh, it kind of gave Calcutta its uh, not Calcutta its very uh, dominant labyrinthine imagination, which is still prevalent in pop, pop culture re uh, renditions. Uh, following uh, following the neoliberal turn, uh, another like. Uh, Following the neoliberal turn, uh, uh, the urban space was reimagined and, uh, and became the venue for development. City sections adjacent to the old metropolis, which is Salt Lake City in Calcutta right now, and, uh, uh, and then for the new town. Uh, city sections adjacent to the old metropolis were, con uh, were configured with spatial continuity, interconnection, and a grid-like structure which kind of uh, is an, uh, which kind of offsets the labyrinthine imagination of the old metropolis and these uh, city sections uh, or these uh, uh, adjacent uh, which were adjacent to the city were designed to be self -cent uh, self contained and autonomous the spaces manifest as uh, private assemblages private gated communities private entertainment and so forth and they sublimate the public character of the city uh, Automobility in, is centered in, uh, in this imagination of the city because assemblages of private capital, because these assemblages of private capital are connected through a network of roads that allow you to bypass mobility, uh, bypass competing mobility demands of the non-automobilized. Uh, so Salt Lake City is one such imagination, one such rendition, and it is serviced by the Eastern Metropolitan Bypass. This is the Eastern Metropolitan Bypass. And this forms the eastern edge of the old metropolis. And it is a major arterial road that connects Salt Lake City and uh, Newtown. Then what happens as we go forward, let's, uh, I need to consider what happens to, this is a, a chronometric sketch of uh, Eastern Metropolitan Bypass. Uh, so this is where Salt Lake is. And it, it connects right to the, uh, it's, it's the eastern end and connects right to the south, southern part of Calcutta. Uh, so what happens to the image of the city when data and algorithm become important actors in the differential urban landscape? Now, before uh, we kind of talk about the data, we need to understand that global navigation satellite system do not work well in urban environments because they imagine a direct line of sight between a receiver and satellite, which is not achievable in the urban setting. Therefore, Uber, what Uber does is that it's it mounts additional data to improve map accuracy. Now this data takes a form of uh, uh, probabilistic shadow matching techniques, 3D maps, signal to noise ratio, et cetera. And uh, they calculate the likelihood of a given receiver location based on satellite signal to noise ratio corresponding to multiple satellites. By doing this over a grid of possible locations, they obtain a likelihood service of possible re receiver lo locations. 
thus uber uses a system of probabilities mapped alongside uh, motion models and data on corresponding locations to essentially guess the location of its users thus data thus data on mobilities and points of concentration effectively accrue to yield the map the to yield the uber map of probabilities so this is a uber map of hotspots and it essentially tells drivers where people are and uh, it uh, as we can see from the map it privileges uh, privileges the mobility needs of people in the central business district which recalls the earlier colonial imagination of the city now this happens because you uber uses a feedback system that uses uber rides to generate information about routes to improve the map so uh, with what happens with because of this is that the data uh, is that the more traffic sections are better represented on the map data so my argue my argument is that data density then goes on to determine uh, the legibility on the uber map so this so when you try to book a ride uh, the uber using its algorithmic processes try to guess your receiver location because like i said gps can be off by 50, uh, at least 50 meters so uh, this is a uh, city center 2 which is on uh, vishwa bangla sarini which is in new town and uh, so when you try just look just consider this image and uh, consider the next image and this is a uh, money square mall which is on the eastern metropolitan bypass and uh, uh, you can clearly see that money square mall has clearly defined access points which is not there in uh, in the earlier map and i'll just take you through the google street view of these uh, sorry uh, just one second yeah so this is a screenshot of the google street view of money square mall and this is a screenshot of the google street view of uh city center 2 now if i take you back to uh if i take you back uh, so you see what uh, the uber data is showing or the uber map is showing is that this area this road is connected to the service road which is not the case in the google street view if you remember uh so if you look at the google street view of the same location this road is actually it it's a two way uh, it's it's a uh, it's a broad street with a divider in between and there are two like you know there there traffic on two sides so this road does not connect to the service road in fact the service road has an entry point somewhere here so what uh, what i'm trying to argue then is that uh, the more uber uses a feedback system that uses uber rides to help improve map and therefore what what the uber map reflects is the uh, is the mobility of the data Uh, mobility uh, of the data affluent now transport transportation inequities do alienate and marginalize neighborhoods infrastructurally this is manifested as the prioritization of flyovers and roads over mass transit system this asymmetry is embedded in pre existing uh, structural biases configured around the politics of identity new town as an upper middle class enclave is perhaps exceptional in being under serviced by public trans transit and uh, so because uh, there is not enough traffic and uh, as a consequence uh, there is not enough data on mobility these uh, uh, you know these spaces become uh, less legible or they, they become illegible on the uber map and uh, if you add to this existing inequity 
data based erasures uh, which can iterate in successive images and cause occlusions of certain geographies therefore uh, uh, so i'll just conclude uh, therefore i i argue that uber kind of re, not only reconfigures and replicates relations of uh, exclusion and marginalization it, they it exacerbates them because of Uh, uh kind of the because of data based erasures of people who are not mobile or uh, people who are not uh, using uh, data inflected mobilities thank you with that i can see yeah uh thank you for uh, your presentation uh, neha Uh, uh all the people who are uh, listening to this uh, on zoom or facebook please put your questions on the chat so that we can take your questions at the end of the panel uh next i welcome prajwal to uh, go ahead with his presentation uh hope it hope the slides are visible um okay uh thank you for the uh, opportunity uh, good afternoon everyone uh, i am uh, prajwal nagesh i am a doctoral student at uh, utrecht university and institute for social and economic change um so here are my co-authors professor ajay begli dr sobin george dr lekha subaya and uh, professor uh, diketama so this paper is part of the larger ecomo project Uh, which stands for inclusive cities through equ equitable access to urban mobility in which we are studying uh, four cities across uh, india and, and bangladesh uh, in the course of next 10 minutes um, i'll try to think about how the current uh, imagination of urban mobility is shaping the the mobility behavior and the lives of older adults um, we're looking particularly in, in bengaluru um so uh so the summary of the presentation is that uh, the mobility of older adults is not just moving from a point a to point b uh if i can leave you with this uh, message then i think i have done just to the presentation um so to introduce the uh, uh, the research and the paper are uh, the two uh, the motivation for the study is uh, twofold the, the first reason is is related to a uh, demographic transition that is i could see from the uh, graph over here that the proportion in the older age uh, group is projected to grow uh, in in uh, developing countries like india um, while the when the proportion of um, the younger age groups are supposed to be dropping over the period of a few years so it is important to understand the the specific needs the mobility needs and concerns of, of the older adults and adding to this another it is also a positive um, line of thinking that the older adults are living much longer they are working uh, uh, much longer than previously uh, they are taking up much more responsibilities in the household uh, and uh, as a result of which the demand to re remain active and seek resources is also much higher than the previous generation so in this context it, it becomes important uh, to study uh, the uh, mobility for older adults in cities like bengaluru and uh, mo uh, the second uh, motivation is the southern urbanism that is looking at how the urbanism is spanning out in the cities of global south uh, like bengaluru um where the infrastructure and the and the resources are being invested uh, quite a lot but in terms of um, the access it's still remaining more exclusionary um so um, we are particularly looking interested in individuals who are living in this multiple sectors of oppression it could be uh, ageism it could be sexism and casteism how all of them interact with each other and more so we looking at uh, bengaluru where the mobility is equated more towards the youth able bodied and working working population so there is a possibility of social exclusion of older adults um and the and the research question that in this context the question that we evaluate is if our current and the future vision of our urban mobility are they exclusive to the needs of uh, older adults mobility so this is the question that the paper plans to answer and we uh, take the um, the tools uh, from the new mobility paradigm so it becomes interesting 
um, the the paradigm developed by two sociologists, where they look at uh, one is that that mobility is more than human. That is, it's not just the mobility of an individual um, across places. It is also the uh, movement of information, goods, and services, and and uh, the scale of fluency and the politics. Uh, by this, what we mean is that uh, it needs to, uh, the mobility needs to be looked at a broader framework that is beyond the local neighborhood movement, where uh, we need to understand the conceptual um, uh, conceptual movements which are taking place. That could be in terms of the spatial justice, the racial justice uh, within the uh, the mobility justice. So all of these tools are crucial to understand the complex processes that are taking place in terms of uh, mobility for older adults. Um, so moving to the field site, um, so field work was conducted in a, a ward uh, called uh, Anjanapra, which is the southernmost uh, periphery of uh, Bengaluru. Uh, it's an erstwhile uh, village which was brought into um, BBMP in 2007, uh, as a result of which it has seen uh, rapid land use changes when the BDA came in. There have been national highways constructed, we have the peripheral ring road, the, the metros which have come up. So. Uh, in terms of the socio-economic uh, changes also, there's been drastic change in terms of the previously uh, uh, agricultural lands uh, within a decade have been changed uh, towards uh, small-scale industries and stone quarries uh, and various other uh, apartment uh, residential places. So the reason for focusing on Anjanapura is that we wanted to bring a matrix of this uh, the less privileged neighborhood, which kind of resembles the uh, and captures the cross-section of these mul multiple vulnerabilities that we have been talking about. So that's the reason why we went with uh, Anjanapra. Um, so the methods that we uh, primarily used is um, the grounded visualization technique, where we try to link the geospatial data and the ethnographic data. Um, so we went about the uh, geospatial data by mapping um, the neighborhood um, using the QGIS software. We had the infrastructural data also put in. And then these maps were, uh, we could see one of the maps over here. Um, so these maps were compared across time, across different days to understand uh, the, the changes and similarities of the mobility patterns of older adults. And second, we carried out the ethnographic interviews where we had the neighborhood walks, um, the in-depth interviews with the older adults and the key informants. Uh, and these interviews were conducted in Canada and translated and transcribed. Um, so go uh, spend more time on the uh, key results. You could always come back if you have any uh, doubts with the um, with the methods. Um, so the so the key results would like to categorize them in three sections. Uh, we have obviously not been presenting everything. Only the main categories have been presented over here. Um, so the first uh, we look at how the older adults and then sorry the aging itself helps in conceptualizing mobility differently for them. And second, uh, we're looking at how the differential uh, mobility and stillness comes out within that. Uh, and thirdly, it's about how the uh, policies are engaging with this different conceptualization. Um, so the first category, we're looking at um, how the conceptualization, that's the lens of an older adult itself is different, how they experience mobility. So the first one I would like to talk about is, um, is slowness, that is um, due to an array of uh, physiological changes. It could be like uh, degenerating eyesight, uh, reducing muscular strength, or uh, lowering energy levels. There is a preference for slowness in mobility. That is, older adults would prefer to travel at a lower speed, and they're threatened by vehicles uh, which travel at much greater speeds on the, on the street. And usually, they try to uh, isolate themselves when they see these things happening, which has happened in Anjanapura for a period of time. And um, Talking about speed, uh, the next aspect was the stillness. That is a uh, very interesting that thing that came about. Because while talking about speed, that uh, the, a major component of aging and mobility is also the importance that the, that the participant gives for stillness. You can see it in the quote over here. It's like due to the lower energy levels, so older adults require shorter breaks in their mobility to recuperate, to recover from their energy uh, recover the energy levels and continue their mobility. So it, this this infrastructure could be in terms of uh, maybe a bench to sit while walking, or, or or waiting infrastructure in the bus stop, or a discontinuous step um, in 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 a metro station. So so this is about the still infra stillness infrastructure is something that they found to be uh, missing quite a lot. And uh, the third aspect is the there's a narrow window of. Uh, uh, mobility that comes out, that is the time of travel. 
the morning and the evening peak hours are usually avoided because of the density so due to the lack of adequate uh, uh, street lighting and then the uh, uh, obvious eyesight issues the travel often uh, becomes much more difficult after sunset so there is a very narrow frame of time when older adults would like to travel but the public transport is not optimized for this kind of uh, window frame um and another interesting thing that came about was uh, their encounter with technology is often much more nuanced and much more challenging that is the new age interventions it could be in terms of the bmtc um, mobile app or it could be the metro escalators it could be the ticketing system of the metros place all of these becomes much more alien to them and much more difficult for them to uh, be um, uh, to access them so that is something that uh, stood out in most of the interviews so amidst these challenges uh, we could also see that there were events of setbacks so these events could be it could be a fall it could be an accident or a surgery so which ended up uh, leading to driving cessation and also a dip in their confidence to be mobile so so this was um, basically looking at from the lens of older adults um and on top of aging if you were going to add on the other uh, stratifications that is uh, how differential mobility emerges for over there so one of the major things is about how class emerges as a major component that is uh, so using the mobility uh, a new mobility paradigm one can argue that that mobility of uh, it's not just bodies but is also the ability to influence uh, the mobility of information goods and services i give an example uh, if there's an older adult with a with a regular and decent pension or an income can always opt for home delivery of services like groceries or attend virtual calls or access information from their home whereas an older adult from a less privileged household would always have a greater dependency um, uh, on the family on the resources and the need for physical travel so as because they cannot induce this mobility of uh, goods and services uh, and information towards them so which is something that we need to broaden and then understand this larger movement and not just the hum- human movement and the second one was we could observe that there was a the gender certification was a major role playing that is uh, due to the feminization of aging that the older women tended to outlive their spouse so often it happened that the death of the husband also meant that the older uh, older women uh, ceased to uh, tra- uh, not travel from then on uh, for example it could uh, the previous travels that they had for to a temple to a park or the native uh, altogether became restricted to their own house so um, and then spending uh, more time on the third part is the community here particularly when i say community um, i would like to talk about a uh, caste over here uh, i like to invoke the phrase the transmutation of caste used by uh, philosophy professor sundar kasalkar uh, he refers to the silent mutation of caste in the urban india so to give an example uh, from the field um, so many of the dalit colonies and slums from the core of the city uh, were were being pushed towards the periphery and anjanapura was one of those sites so this led to a ghetto ghettoization um, of the places and uh, and it changes the way in which an uh, older adult who had spent a large part of the life in the core have to engage with the city staying in the periphery so uh, so in, 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 these are the subtle ways in which a uh, caste uh, played out in terms of uh, as a stratification and it's also interestingly caste also operated as a coping mechanism that is many of the dalit organizations and the mosques uh, were arranging uh, vans auto rickshaws for medical trips and also for spiritual uh, trips Uh, some of them are also uh, organizing trips to bima karagon for uh, for uh, older adults so could, uh, we need more uh, research to understand how caste uh, works more in a more nuanced way in terms of differential mobility and also as coping mechanism um moving to the uh, last part of the results that is how the uh, policy engages with the transportation you could see from this uh, diagram that the preference of older adults have been on a different uh, uh, direction Uh, whereas the the policy uh, focus infrastructure and funding have been uh, more towards uh, automobility and more towards the modern and expensive railway system and technology backed solutions to give an example of how this is uh, a, a bit problematic that is uh, the bus pass for older adults mm-hmm. which is a lifeline for them was not uh, has not made its way into the the metro system uh, despite providing a better uh, design infrastructure in the metro 
in the pricing is unaffordable uh, it, it closes the door and on older adults uh, without the stable income or a pension so at this juncture it's not just um, a movement from the bus system to the metro system but there is a shift in e- uh, equity that's happening which we need to uh, keep much closer uh, uh, look on so i would like to say that uh, a lot more research needs to capture the subjectiveness of these mobility experiences um so I'd like to uh, move to the uh, the conclusion so to conclude uh, the approach of aging and mobility requires a, a, a broader conceptualization than transport it, it is not just again like moving from uh, a to b so firstly what we uh, need to uh, understand is that the frameworks needs to encompass elements beyond human mobility we need to understand the broader socio techn- uh, technical assemblages um which is governing the movements of uh, civic services it could be goods and information um and second um, um we need to um, understand that that mobility or um, immobility is is a result of the multiple crises that's are panning out and needs a political lens than a more uh, design or infrastructural approach uh, thank you um so i'd like to also thank uh, the um, uh, participants and the key informants uh, from the anjana par award also like to thank the uh, praja vimochana sangha and mr d munawara for their extended support uh, here are the academic institutions and our funders nwo votro uh, to uh, have more uh, uh, frequent updates from the equimo project you can always follow us on these uh, social media platforms thank you thank you prajwal uh so uh, like i said before uh, all all the all the attendees uh, please put your questions up in the q and a part of the zoom call or on facebook cha- uh, comments so that we can take it up at the end uh, next we have uh, uh, shiti shobha vikas uh, presenting on uh, exploratory research on the use of public transport by fisher women in mumbai Yeah. Thank you Pooja. Uh I'll just quickly start sharing screen. Is my screen visible? Okay just going to begin so hi everyone thank you for uh, attending this panel and for everybody here uh, i'm kshiti shobha vikas from st xavier's college and uh, i'm going to be sharing some part of my research about the public transport utilization by fisher women uh, in mumbai and these are few of my discussion points but before we dive right in i'd like to uh, draw attention Uh, draw all of you guys' attention in terms of what motivated my research. Um, so I have been commuting through the local train for the past four years, and most of my mornings have been dotted um, by the imaginations, not just the imaginations, but the realities of uh, fisher folk on the CST platform and uh, their hustle and bustle. And along with that, uh, it has also consisted of the Dabba Walas of Mumbai. who are known for their very unique organizational structure uh, and so i would be discussing both of these aspects but uh, my focus is on fisher women and this particular demographic uh, dabba walas come in only in terms of a comparative analysis so moving on uh before we begin in terms of the fisher community itself i'd like to uh, explain that uh, the koi community in mumbai is one of the most prominent uh, fisher uh, fishing community uh, and it's important to acknowledge their contributions in terms of uh, expanding this community this particular industry uh, in the city they are often heralded as one of the most uh, as one of the original inhabitants of the city because they've been here from the 16th uh, century when mumbai was just an island city and uh, not the bustling metropolis that it is now so it's very obvious why their uh, numbers are sort of scanty at the moment and while for a few of them and a few generations rather have mobilized into other occupations a lot of them also like 
continue to um, thrive in these traditional livelihood uh, alternatives uh, that they have. And so it's important to discuss the role of women over here because this particular community confers a lot of responsibility on the women of their community when it comes to trading and selling fish in the retail marketplace. So uh, all of this together motivated my research and now we'll get right into it. So um, first things first, I'd like to discuss uh, why the term fisherwomen and uh, while this seems like an innocuous sort of question, uh, I think it's important to pay attention to it because uh, while I was conducting my research, I came across several instances where people use the term women vendors who happen to be uh, uh, sorry, fish vendors who happen to be women. And uh, while that's absolutely true and a matter of choice, I think uh, it's important for us to acknowledge the fact that uh, this particular term is very potent when it comes to this particular community because, uh, because of the fact that this is a traditional livelihood opportunity for them and not just a mere alternative. Uh, colloquially, uh, fisher women from this community are called coins or corny. Um, and since this is a very culturally defined sort of uh, choice circle that they have, uh, since they have historic networks in this particular domain, uh, which eases their uh, mobility in this particular occupation, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, the fact that uh, this term is uh, endowed to them and uh, sort of... Uh, dawned by them with a lot of pride, which is why I choose to subscribe to calling them fisherwomen. Um, these are some other pictures. This image is actually from Sassoon Docks, which is one of the most prominent places of business uh, for the fishing community. And the pictures that you can see here uh, is sort of like a hall of fame when it comes to uh, people from the community who have uh, contributed significantly in terms of mobilizing it and in terms of the fishing business itself. Uh, so as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I was also very interested in staging a sort of comparative analysis between the Dabawalas of Mumbai and the fisher women uh, of Mumbai with respect to how they utilize public transport, because uh, there are two key points that I have been able to identify through my research, uh, which uh, act as points of difference in terms of uh, sort of putting one community at a disadvantage not at the expense of this particular one, uh, that is Dabawalas. So um, while Mumbai's Dabawalas is a, a relatively recent organization as compared to fisher women who have been here in the city since centuries, uh, the kind of political patronage that Dabawalas have been able to garner is very, uh, is very significant to the kind of mobility in terms of socioeconomic senses that they have been political patronage defines um, the ways in which certain demographics can uh, mobilize uh, in their particular domains, which is why it's important to consider how Dabawalas have been able to uh, gather a lot of political leadership and lobbying on their side, which fisher women have not been able to garner uh, in the same strength as Dabawalas. Um, Further, gender plays a very important role in terms of how a certain community of people, not just along communal lines, but along demographic lines, you I figured out uh, through my research, and uh, it's, it's not just my research, of course, a lot of secondary research has been made and a lot of recommendations have been made about how uh, the accessibility of fisherwomen for, uh, towards public transport is very scarce because of the ways in which their business uh, functions and because of the ways in which they have to portray um, their business identity as well as gender identity uh, in their negotiations of um, public transport utilization, especially local trains, which is the foci uh, that I found, it's basically uh, how much Dabawalas earn on a monthly basis. They uh, actually, because of the kind of political patronage that they have been able to muster, uh, got themselves a special train since 2012, which fisherwomen and researchers who have been focusing on this demographic have been lobbying for since a long time, but has not been able to uh, 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 find its essence in reality. Uh, there's only about 5,000 and more Dabawalas, whereas there's no data available in terms of the actual figures or even approximate figures of fisher women in the city. Um, and while they earn about 9k to 21k on a monthly basis, this is like 9k is not their lower limit. They can go lower and we'll see how, especially when it comes to crises like COVID-19 and other such stuff, uh, which will be discussed in due course. 
uh the next argument that i was motivated by when i got down to conducting this research was public transport as a means of agency um now public transport is one space where a person can use that particular uh, system without having to necessarily without having to rely on uh, other sort of uh, mediators especially when it comes to fisher women since they are women uh, they and since a lot of the times they cannot carry their fish baskets in the ladies compartment a lot of them subscribe to having head loaders do it for them and the head loaders in uh, this compartment and we have all seen i mean people who have stayed in mumbai know how uh, fisher women are welcomed in a ladies compartment um, and it's not a very easy task to negotiate that sort of space because of the ways in which they are treated uh, although yes the western line does have a luggage compartment which is only ladies specific that has not been extended to other lines in the uh, local train system of mumbai uh, next is mobility Uh, it's important to consider how mobility uh, is enhanced when it comes to uh, fisher women using public transport because their ease of doing business um, gets enhanced to another level since they have just one way of commuting from their place of business to uh, the retail marketplace that they have to reach in order to sell their product to the agency of a woman uh, for her womanhood and in terms of performing her business identity as well uh, the third point that i'd like to talk about is how public transport engenders uh, aids in engendering the commute uh, in terms of uh, the gender composition of the system of traveling itself so it could be local trains it could be buses it could be rickshaws as well uh, but it's important to find and understand how these systems can be made more gender friendly which is actually the crux of my paper this is just an essence of uh, what goes in it uh, and the last point is about it being a very important factor uh, that contributes to one's personal agency and improves one's socio economic capital because there's a lesser reliance on middlemen and mediators and hence lesser operational costs and um, more than anything else as you shift places you also shift spaces so that opens a lot of opportunities in terms of alternative livelihood options as well um, which are any way limited in terms of fisher women um here are a couple of videos that i'd like to show uh, which really put what i'm trying to say about uh, public transport do that
All right. So those couple of videos were about uh, how this woman uh, really aims to own a rickshaw by herself because uh, she doesn't like depending on the rickshaw wala uh, who doesn't really pay attention to the way her fish is being commuted, like transported through the rickshaw. So I thought it would be interesting to watch in terms of how it gives her a sort of personal agency after she owns her own rickshaw. Um, and I will uh, uh, debrief the video even more in case it wasn't clear. Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, moving on, uh, there were a few key challenges that uh, a research by Professor Amita Bhide from uh, TIS has identified, and these include uh, inaccessible train platforms. So what happens is platforms have really steep steps and the kind of baskets that fisherwomen carry on their heads, the weight of those to rely on head loaders to travel through the luggage compartment and themselves to go in the ladies compartment. And finally, infrequent train. So a lot of the fisherwomen have to wake up in the wee hours of the morning at about 3.34 um, to start their business and then to reach their retail marketplace. And at the time, there aren't a lot of trains available, which is why they have to organize um, tempos and trucks and stuff like that which isn't very feasible unless uh, unless there's an organized network that's working behind it, which does not favor individual really small uh, businesswomen uh, in this particular demographic. Uh, further, I don't think uh, I can conclude without including the impact of COVID-19 because uh, there were severe losses in business with respect to the kind of uh, uh, processes that were already initiated and uh, how the lockdown uh, very abruptly uh, put an end to all of it. And one of those things include uh, deep sea fishing, one trip of which costs about 2.5 lakh. Some of these things were already underway when the lockdown was announced. So the, uh, the fish that was brought back owing to its perishable nature was never consumed and never uh, really sold. So no business really happened. There were no gains to recover pre-existing costs such as these. Um, there, were, there, there are no reliable alternatives uh, to livelihood as some of them are heavily de dependent on this particular traditional source of living. Um, and more than anything else, the 61 day annual ban that takes place in the country uh, provide does not provide for this particular uh, demographic in the city of Mumbai, or sorry, in the city of Mumbai and the state of Maharashtra. Other states provide some sort of monthly compensation, at least uh, in terms of kind or cash, but the state of Maharashtra does not provide uh, these kind of uh, uh, these kind of strategies and compensation for this demographic. Um, I'd like to talk about a few recommendations that came up in my research and some of which I uh, truly believe in. The first one being targeted welfare schemes because not all women that I'm talking about uh, are involved in self-help groups or cooperatives that are organized. Some of them are very uh, independent, small business women who do not uh, get accounted for in the kind of welfare schemes that are in place, which is why it's important to have really targeted welfare schemes. Secondly, uh, our public transport needs to adopt a more gender friendly nature so as to cater to all sections um, of uh, people who travel through uh, uh systems that are in place, more importantly, people who travel through it for uh, ease, for, for uh, easing out their business and for reducing operational costs for the same, especially for this demographic that does not really have an alternative uh, source of living. Uh, finally, there needs to be some sort of pilot research and monitoring, which leads us to economically viable solutions, because some people have suggested motorization of the, uh, of the commute of fish from the docks to the marketplace, and that is not a very economically viable uh, solution because the way in which uh, the business identities of fisherwomen gets negated altogether. And that's just one of the many reasons why it's not viable. Lastly, uh, when it comes to people like you and I who travel through local trains, the least we could do is practice inclusivity in existing compartments because the reason that a fisherwoman uses a ladies compartment in the first place is because of
few recommendations finally i'd like to talk about uh, some of the really really uh, major limitations in my research which include a heavy reliance on secondary research uh, thanks to the pandemic unfortunately i could not uh, conduct uh, focus group discussions or interviews to understand and hear for Uh, from the fisher women themselves but i have relied on uh, research that has done the same uh, there is a heavy sort of data scarcity when it comes to the numbers that are accounted for the numbers that are present so mitigating that space was a little difficult and may have reflected in the kind of conclusions that i have drawn and lastly my personal social location is quite uh, in nature and that's about it this is a big thank you to fisher women and to everybody watching this uh thank you uh, shruti uh, for this presentation uh next up we have uh, sakshi Dosh joshi from uh, manipal academy of higher education yeah thank you i'm going to start sharing my screen yeah. now uh Yeah, I hope this is visible to everyone. And uh, thank you all of you for joining us. And hi, I'm Sakshi, as I've been introduced before. And uh, I'm uh, a postdoctoral researcher with the Equimod project. My colleague Prachwal briefly introduced about the project earlier. And uh, this uh, paper that I am presenting at the moment is part of that ongoing research. And here I am going to focus on the free bus rides for women scheme, which was launched in Delhi. Uh, so briefly about uh, the scheme first, it's, yeah. So uh, the scheme, the intent of the scheme was basically to improve women's safety by increasing their visibility, by encouraging them to step out more. The scheme was announced in uh, 2019. At the time of the announcement, uh, it included both uh, the Delhi Transport Corporation buses as well as the Delhi Metro, uh, where the government would be bearing the cost Uh, for uh, women's travel. So it came to be known as quote unquote free. And, uh, but when the scheme was eventually launched, the folk, um, it was uh, restricted to the DTC buses and uh, not the Metro. Now through our research, we want to explore how the scheme was actually imagined and how it came to be experienced by women commuters. And one thing when I was, uh, you know, like being a part of this panel, one of the things that I was thinking about myself is that when we talk about imagination, is the imagination being a change maker or is it reproducing existing practices? So that was one question that was there in my head. So before we go to the key findings, um, uh, why the focus on women's safety? Uh, for this particular scheme. So existing literature and personal experience tells that there has been a lot of resistance to women's presence in Delhi's public spaces. Uh, the percentage of women commuters in public transports has been low. Uh, Delhi records for one of the highest rate of crimes against women in the country, according to NCRB stats. And women uh, feel highly unsafe and vulnerable in public spaces, including public transport. Now we Now this impacts their access to the city and the kind of opportunities it might provide. And uh, so we borrow from the theory of genderscape, which uh, basically discusses that Delhi belongs to a patriarchal code, like the region, within this region, a social value of women is actually uh, derived primarily from their reproductive role especially the ability to bear sons. And uh, so um, anything apart from this can actually lead to a lot of, you know, there is a lot of implicit and explicit violence that women have to undergo. So genderscape is this imagined multi-layered space where because of these specific socio-cultural settings, women do undergo these different implicit and explicit everyday violences. And that leads, that kind of continues in uh, public spaces, uh, this resistance because this resistance is again rooted in the social cultural settings and the imagination of the public space of the infrastructure where uh, women and their needs are not primary they are not priorities are part of this resistance so what happens is the envisioning of the scheme was basically 
you know it focused on the increasing of women's visibility as a counter to this resistance hoping that it would impact women's access to the city that it would lead to a greater access to the city now how did we carry out the data collection and analysis for uh, this present research so there were actually two strands one we wanted to understand how the scheme was imagined for that we looked at news and blogs between this particular period uh, the analysis focused on key themes that we uh, observed were emerging and also whose responses uh, were being uh, reproduced on the other hand we wanted to understand how the scheme was experienced after its launch for that we conducted in depth interviews between this period um the interviews were transcribed from hindi to english and eventually we they underwent a thematic analysis where we generated codes now we'll uh, come to our key findings now the first part of the findings is how the scheme was imagined within that first we will look at how the scheme was envisioned now in the dialog box here uh there are two quotes from uh, two um two members of the aam aadmi party now on the one hand the focus of the scheme was to help women reclaim public spaces by increasing their numbers but on the other hand during the announcement during subsequent speeches again and again women were not addressed directly as citizens they were always a common man the sister or wife or daughter or uh, you know the the scheme itself was a gift from a brother to his sister so we see that ultimately it is within these existing constructs uh, that the scheme uh, was announced and the scheme got promoted uh, the other aspect is how the scheme was discussed now in the dialog box on your screens you would see some key news and blog uh, headlines that appeared uh there were mixed reactions there were also positive approaches as well as uh, opposition skepticism cynicism and we see a divide uh homemakers students blue collar workers were more receptive and uh, more positive about the scheme they sincerely believe that you know it was going to help them save money that it was definitely going to increase women's numbers in public spaces on the other hand questioning about revenue whether it is a political gimmick that oh it might be a step back for gender equality because you know what women can pay we see that largely such quotes were coming from uh, white collar professionals and uh, transport and mobility researchers were actually worried about uh, uh they did not outright reject the scheme but they were just worried about the kind of impact on existing infrastructure that uh, uh, an increase in ridership might have next we come to how the scheme was experienced now on your screens you would see the map of delhi and within this what i call the very tiny elephant is sangam vihar it is an unplanned settlement on the delhi haryana border and this is where we, uh, i undertook uh, the field work now by unplanned uh, by an unplanned settlement i mean that it has not been legally recognized by the government so there is um, negligible to rudimentary access to basic services including transport uh, housing now to access the larger city people first have to reach the main road from sangam vihar and reaching the main road itself you know it requires either you walk or you uh, take shared transport and then once you reach the main road metro is a, a considerably more expensive option it is also quite far away, up, away like the nearest metro stations are between 5 to 7 kilometers away and they also um they also require greater intermodal changes so buses are a primary mode for the residents of this place to connect with the larger city and the uh, interview participants were actually both frequent and infrequent bus users who had been using the buses before the scheme and after the scheme was launched as well so what did we see um again i'm going to talk about some of the key findings um uh, the reactions were mixed there were people who uh, there were participants who felt that it was really helping them save money it was 
yes, it had uh, led to greater visibility. It was giving them greater agency. So there was a lot of skepticism also. I also observed that uh, uh, being pro or against the scheme also dependent upon your uh, personal political inclination. One thread that was common across interviews was the hostile responses that uh, the participants had started receiving from men now that they had started boarding the buses. And um, the jibes that the women had started getting uh, were not restricted to the current scheme. They also started including the reservation of seats for women. So this kind of added to the negative uh, bus journey experience where I remember one of the participants saying, that that made her angry listening to such comments second as i mentioned previously agency definitely like um the students and the homemakers especially they felt that it was uh you know they did not they did not need to ask for money anymore they did not have to do that uh there was clearly an impact on bus services uh, the participants felt that uh, the buses have become even more overcrowded, which was kind of having a spillover effect on how their entire journey would pan out. Because if the uh, bus was too overcrowded, some of them preferred skipping the bus and waiting for another one. If that wasn't happening, then they risked getting touched or uh, having their stuff uh, stolen. Uh, and also, if they had to wait, that meant an increase in their travel time, which then meant reaching their destination late or even reaching their home later than usual, later than a certain deadline, which could have consequences. So some key conclusions that we drew from our findings, one, definitely, as the scheme and vision, there was an increase in women's visibility but it was accompanied by an increase in resistance to their presence in public spaces. The scheme and the larger discussions around it focused on in-vehicle travels, whereas women's journeys are door-to-door -door mobilities. You know, they are to and from mobilities. The early and last mile connectivity have to be considered. In fact, women start planning for their journeys much before the actual journey even begins. Then Commuting experiences are part of women's daily routines. They are not away from it and they constitute spillover effects for women because, you know, they have to come back home and also kind of comply or fulfill the expected gender roles as well. Then schemes targeting women's mobilities need to address the challenges and possibilities within this ambit of the gender roles that are being enacted. And for doing that in-depth knowledge of women's experiences of using existing infrastructures is you can be useful for measures which are targeting you know inclusive transport usage uh with that i would like to end this and thank you so much for being a patient audience a big shout out to the participants and local collaborators for their time cooperation and their knowledge and uh, to the dutch research council for funding this uh, project in case you want to know more, know more about the project, please do check out our Twitter, Facebook pages. The website link is also given and you can also reach out to me. So thank you so much. I'll stop sharing the screen now. I can't. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sakshi. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, so let's uh, go into the question and answer and discussion. So I have uh, one question uh, to Neha, which is, uh, I, I, there are two questions. So I'm just going to combine it and ask it. One is basically about, uh, you know, how basically what the technology used by Uber is, which is leading to this exacerbated exacerbated uh, uh, you, know, you know how is it exacerbating the existing inequalities what is the technology part of it that you had mentioned uh, they want more elaboration on that and the second part is uh, on how how do you get access to the uber hotspot data so more of like what is hotspot data and how do you get access to it so like clarifying questions Yeah, hi. So I'll just answer the question about the Uber hotspot data first. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Uber uh, kind of uh, has a website uh, and a, a social media presence via Uber engineering. 
So where they discuss engineering aspects of Uber. So I accessed a lot of my data from there. So I basically got the map of Uber hotspots from there, which kind of, uh, I then, uh, when I found congruence and, uh, uh, you know, how, uh, uh, when I, uh, uh, I, sorry, I'm just a little distracted by the chat question that just popped yeah. up. Yeah. Anyway, so when I looked at this Uber hotspot map and I saw congruence with the old colonial maps of Calcutta, I thought this is worth exploring and highlighting, etc. Because, uh, what happens is even though even as we uh, even as the city is shifting outwards and uh, Calcutta is especially expanding towards the eastern part uh, with Salt Lake City and uh, Newtown etc. So even as that is happening, uh, uh, data uh, Uber Maps still kind of uh, it, it it kind of recalls the. Uh, uh, old colonial map, which highlights the central part of the city, the CBD of the city, which is around Park City area and uh, Chorangi uh, at uh, that side, which was the erstwhile white town. So, um, uh, so I mean, uh, so I, I mean, it was that was interesting to me, and I I kind of uh, then understood that this is happening because traffic presents is still more over there. Now, now I'll get to why, uh, what are the algorithmic, uh, algorithmic processes that kind of define that. So I, uh, I have used uh, some, uh, uh, quite a few examples in the larger paper and the larger research that I have conducted, but I'm giving one uh, example from there. So they have this algorithmic process called uh, catch me. It's called, it's a catch map error. All right. So what happens uh, through this is that uh, if uh, the, if, the user or if a ride kind of deviates from the algorithmic determined route. So the algorithmic, uh, the algorithm uh, projects a route that you are supposed to take when you take an Uber. Uh, but if you de deviate from this route, then the algorithm uh, via cap, uh, catch uh, map error, they'll kind of compare the two routes and then try to kind of, uh, 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 then later on, they'll kind of ac account for the deviations in route. And uh, if the route, if that route proves to be better, then they'll try to kind of uh, project that route next time, all right? So uh, so, so, what happens is the Uber map accuracy improves uh, with more rides. So essentially what happens is that uh, this tends to reflect the, uh, you know, automobile, this, this, this kind of projects a more automobile centered imagination of the city. Uh, if uh, like you know, and and this this is why this these are the some of the algorithm and what happens is that as as more as the Uber map comes to reflect the these uh, data kind of concentrated environments more and more the less traffic section and consequently the less data uh, the you know the data poor sections will kind of get uh, face erasures from the map and they'll they'll get uh, you know. Uh, uh, they'll get invisibilized on the map. So that's, that is the point that I was uh, trying to make. I, uh, yeah, thank you, yeah. Uh, Neha. Yeah, uh, we have a bunch of questions for Sakshi. Uh, one is basically asking if uh, you looked at uh, ridership of uh, uh, Metro, impact of ridership of Metro by women because of the free uh, pa passes for in the bus. Uh, the second is uh, about, uh, you know, where this whole, whole policy came from, like what was the initiation of the policy and uh, whether women were part of the decision making in this policy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for those questions. Actually, they're very good questions. For the first one, I'd just like to say that uh, uh, it is since our project is still ongoing in the second phase of the project. Now we are going to focus on Delhi Metro. Uh, in the first part, when uh, in Sangam Vihar, when I was conducting interviews, it was around buses and the travel behavior that we were looking at. So uh, I, what I do know is from secondary literature. So the primary work is going to be undertaken this year. We took a hit last year because of the pandemic. Otherwise, I think I would have been able to give a clearer uh, answer uh, to this one. Um, and uh, for the second one, thank you once again. Uh, the initiative for the policy, again, I can say I have not had the opportunity to talk directly with the government officials regarding this. So it comes from the interviews or the secondary literature that I have uh, gone through, which is available. So um, 
the uh, intent of the initiative again it was uh, unlike in other countries where usually uh, fare free public transport initiatives have focused on sustainable mobility and access to all um, it is because of uh, you know this image that delhi has about being supremely unsafe for women so like kind of the root was there and um, it was also assumed and envisioned that uh, if uh, women's numbers would increase it would have a spillover effect on other things also like it would lead to sustainable mobility it might reduce air pollution so with the safety as the focus other spillover um, effects were expected uh what i do know is that uh, since aap the delhi party at that time was uh, the one implementing it so they definitely do have women ministers and i did uh, present atishi marlena's quote and she is a women uh, a politician from aam aadmi party so yeah thank you yeah thank you uh, for that uh, we don't have any more questions but uh, i would uh, like to say that this was a wonderful panel uh, we through all the panel discussions we kind of saw how uh, whether it is like mobility infrastructure or even like mobility technologies like uber and even initiatives which are intended to you know include certain section of the society is uh, you know ultimately leading to consequences which might be exclusionary in nature so i think it's a good uh, the panel is a good reminder for uh, everyone working in the cities and uh, in the transportation sector to kind of Uh, be more aware of you know what your uh, you know what what you the work you do how can what kind of impact it has in terms of including the different you know user groups or you know even different spaces within the city so uh, that's uh, uh, that's pretty much it if anyone has any other questions uh, i would uh, take it otherwise uh, uh, uh so i i just have one i have one question for prajwal i mean i think uh, i i mean which actually it comes from looking at shiti's uh, like the video on ipt and how important it is so uh, can you just talk a little bit about how ipt is like the role of ipt in mobility of the elderly if uh i think uh, the ipt uh, is one of the central uh, i mean it plays a very uh, interesting role in terms of for especially for older adults in terms i it provides this this door to door mobility i think which cuts short the intermodal changes uh, the problems that they usually face um and um, the ways in which um, the local community organizations um also they have understood that uh, especially for this medical emergencies uh, especially where the hospitals like the victoria the sanjay gandhi hospitals are uh, sent, uh, are uh, located in the center parts of the city which is extremely difficult for somebody who is ill to travel uh, changing different modes so that is when these organizations have been able to pull in uh, and bring in the ipt um, and help them travel to these places and make those crucial uh, journeys uh without uh, paying an advance money that is they wouldn't have to pay for this ipt on spot uh, it is more of a community initiative and they could always pay them because they know them more personally and they've grown up with them um so that that's the central way in which uh, ipt has been used uh, thank you so much for the question pooja yeah, yeah no problem uh yes yeah so i mean it's also interesting how like uh, ipt is i mean when we think of mobility we think of uh, just movement but here when we think of older adults we have to think about the health you know requirements which is what is catering to and in chitis uh, presentation we clearly saw that you know urban freight which is often ignored when we talk about urban mobility is such a core part of you know so important for certain sections of our society uh, so i think we are out of time so thank you all the panelists for your wonderful uh, presentations it was a great learning experience for all of us uh, to all the attendees uh, will take a short break now and the next panel will begin at 420 thank you